done. Rootstock time. <laughs> we are back. It's another year. Another Rootstock. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on YouTube today. Uh, my name's Alex Jenkin. I am Russell Arnott, and we are going to be your guides through the world of plant science for the next hour and a half. So we are joining you uh, live today from the Sainsbury Laboratory in Cambridge. Uh, welcome. It's kind of a big deal, the Sainsbury Laboratory in Cambridge. It's basically like the place that plot the coolest plant science happens in the UK. It's awesome. Um, we've also got some exciting plant science partners joining us today. So um, we're also streaming live on the Rothamsted Research YouTube channel. Uh, Rothamsted are a leading non-profit research organisation and they focus on agricultural uh, research. We're going to be hearing from some people who work for Rothamsted uh, a little bit later on. That's cool. We're also partnering with the Royal Society of Biology, which is kind of cool. They're also kind of a big deal. They are kind of just in charge of biologists who, uh, who hang out in the UK and further afield. Yeah, we've got some things from them that we'll, we'll show you some of the things that they work on a bit later on. Um, and we're also partnering with Fuse School. Uh, Fuse School will uh, be joining us a bit later on as well. Uh, they are democratising access to science education. They've got loads of videos on YouTube, so do go and have a while our sessions are running, no. a little bit later. Their videos are awesome, beautiful animations. And of course, we're from these awesome organisations which have got some acronyms. So I believe you're from something called SAPS. I am. So I run a project called SAPS, which stands for Science and Plants for Schools. Um, and we focus on supporting teachers and school science technicians across the whole of the UK. Uh, if you are doing any plant science practical work in schools, it's very likely that that's some of uh, the projects that we've worked on. Um, we also have developed all sorts of different resources for use in schools. Most recently we sent out some posters, so do have a look out for those on your classroom walls. Awesome, and of course this whole thing is done by the Gatsby Plant Science Education Programme and it's just brilliant. It's just out there trying to get more and more people into plant research, which is what we're trying to do today with Rootstock. We've got some great videos that were made by students and scientists who study plant science. And these videos, they're a lot of fun. They came here to this very space back in uh, summertime, and they made, they spent a couple of days messing around and learning how to make um, fun plant science videos, which we're going to showcase to you today. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to hear also from some of the people who took part in Rootstock. So we've got some pre-recorded comments from people who couldn't join us live today, but we've also got uh, some people who are joining us live online. Uh, there will be to talk, to talk about their video. So please make sure you ask some questions. You might have seen some of those banners coming up on the bottom of the screen already. Uh, we can bring up your questions so you can ask us questions. Um, we've both had jobs in plant science um, and, and uh, we can also ask the, some of the researchers questions. You can also ask the students questions. Um, and in fact, I'm going to encourage you to uh, get involved in that straight away. So in order to do that, if you're not sure, if you've not commented on a live stream before, some of you might be old hands. You just need to, whichever live stream you're watching, just type it into the, uh, the comments that are running um, on the video and they will all come through and be able to sort through them and bring them up live. Um, so I think we'll try and get started. If anyone wants to add something in to say, are you excited about Rootstock today? Start, introduce yourself in the comments. Say where, where you're, you're joining us from. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to bring up uh, your questions a bit later on. So it'd be interesting to, to see that. And I've got to say, there's no such thing as a silly question. Uh, I found, I used to be a teacher, and teaching about plants, there's, it's always, it can be quite difficult. And you think, <laughs> oh, not more photosynthesis equation. Okay, I get it, uh, photosynthesis equation. There is so much more to plants. So even if you're like, well, hold on a sec, like you're interested in plant science careers, you're interested, you've heard like a weird thing, like what's the biggest plant, what's the smelliest plant, what's the coolest flower, anything. There's no such thing as a silly question and we are definitely armed with loads of loads of awesome plant facts. Um, 
It's one of my favourite things, awesome plant facts. Have you got a favourite plant fact? Oh, a favourite plant fact. Yes, my favourite plant fact is, um, you might already know that peanuts actually grow in the ground. Um, they're sometimes called ground nuts. Um, I used to think that they grew on the roots of the plant. That is not true. Um, so what happens is the flowers of the plant get pollinated mm. um, and then the nuts start to grow. And what the plant does is it then buries, it grows down and buries the peanuts in the soil. Whoa. So that's, that's my favourite cool. plant fact. So a peanut plants itself, basically. Yeah, that, yeah, absolutely. That's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think if I've got a cool plant fact. I've, there's a really cool vine called the chameleon vine that they recently discovered in South America. And it climbs up other plants. And as it climbs up those plants, each new leaf that it makes copies the plant that it climbs up. And it can copy, it can change the size, the shape, the colour of its leaf. And people are trying to figure out how they do this. So they assumed that the plant gave off chemicals and they kind of absorbed mm. that. But then they did this experiment with a plastic plant and the chameleon vine still changed. It was pretty crazy. So this basically means that plants can see. And what we've got here, this is a sago palm. Hi, sago palm. And it's kind of a weird idea when you think that plants can see that, you know, <laughs> sago palm here is just hanging out and uh, is, is kind of enjoying the live stream space with us. So let's get on with our first video. And let's just start off. It's going to be pretty cool. It's called Plant Revolution. Uh, it's by three of the Rootstock attendees, uh, Katie Wright, Emily Blythe and Tom Kaup. And uh, this is a great place to start. They're just going to tell us about how awesome plants are and why we should care about them. Let's do it. Seaweed can be used to create lots of biodegradable products to replace non-biodegradable plastics. This would reduce microplastic accumulation, protecting our wildlife and health. Produced by fermentation of sugarcane, this ethanol can be used as a sustainable fuel with up to 90% lower emissions than gasoline or diesel. Its purpose is to act as a supplementary material to a variety of compounds, such as partially replacing cement in concrete. This increases concrete durability and strength, as well as making it more environmentally friendly. Leather derived from animal hides generates enormous quantities of waste and utilises substantial amounts of energy. Alternatives like apple and mango leather made from the peels of these fruits are biodegradable and just as durable. A well-insulated home can help reduce energy costs as they continue to rise. The hollow, insulating fibres of milkweed make it ideal for construction-grade thermal insulation, reducing demand for fibreglass, which can harm human health. Most synthetic dyes are created by carcinogenic compounds such as rhodamine B. Instead, plant-based alternatives such as beta cyanins derived from dragon fruit and beetroot are non-toxic and biodegradable. That was pretty awesome video. Amazing stuff. And all of those different ways that plants can be used, which is pretty cool. I particularly like the seaweed one. Uh, last month, I was really lucky enough to visit the Caramore Seaweed Farm in Pembrokeshire in Wales, and they're actually taking the seaweed and turning it into flower pots, which ah. means you can directly plant the plant in the soil with the flower pot, and then the seaweed breaks down and fertilizes the That's plant. That's really cool. It's like, like such that. a great idea. Yeah, I, I recently did, I was thinking about talking about plant dyes there um, and using plants, plants to uh, dye different materials. I recently did a workshop um, here based in the Botanic Garden, which is also, um, just nearby um, and also you'll see it in some of the background of some of the videos um, you saw the glass houses in that video actually just now um, uh, we recently did a workshop where we made lots of different plant dyes using some really using things uh, harvested from the botanic garden uh, it's really cool. interesting you get some really amazing colors it was really fun plant dyes and paints I've heard that onion skins make really awesome colors 
and you can totally like just get those, boil those up and paint with them. That was one of the things I did when I was a teacher. It was quite a popular one making uh, onion skin dyes. So that's kind of cool. So uh, I'm just having a quick look. I mean, yeah, that's, it's absolutely nuts that all the things you can do with mm -hmm. plants. It's so. amazing. So and hopefully um, you're inspired by that video. Uh, there's still lots that we uh, there is to find out about plants and what we can do with plants. They're going to be really important for making things in the future. So um, and now, uh, so uh, hopefully uh, you're inspired, and we will I think head on to um, our next video, which is actually an introduction um, from one of the students who worked on this uh, project. Uh, so we've got an introduction from. Susanna, uh, Susanna Iden, she's at the University of Essex and she's studying uh, a degree in global sustainability. That's, um, that's a pretty awesome degree, I've got to say. I must admit, I didn't realise they had awesome degrees like that. And so this is another thing that you can ask questions about to people. If you're curious, like, what can I do with plant science? Where can I study it? What kind of thing? Doing a degree in something as broad as global sustainability, also ridiculously important. So do, if you've got any careers questions, any questions about how to get into plant science, what to study at university, any of these things, do pop those in the comments. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do our best to answer your questions. Um, so we will now hear from uh, Susanna Iden. Uh, so here's her intro to her video. Hello there. So my name is Susanna and I'm a second year global sustainability student at the University of Essex. Um, I took part in Rootstock the summer of this year and it was a really enjoyable experience for me. I'm first going to go into a bit of background as to how I got interested in plant science itself because I hadn't really known much about it before. I obviously went outside and appreciated plants and nature but I didn't know exactly what was going on in the kind of ecosystems around us but I took an introduction to plant biology module last year and my teachers on that course were absolutely excellent. One of them is called Tracy Lawson and she's a world renowned expert in the plant science field. She's just won a fellowship with the Royal Society um, so that she can carry on researching into how to protect food security and make sure we're still feeding everyone even as populations kind of grow out of control. Um, so her enthusiasm and her knowledge really got me excited in plants and how to Im improve crop yield and things and how to make photosynthesis more efficient. Um, and she was my mentor for when I applied to the Rootstock program because it is a competitive program. But if you've got yourself a good mentor and you write a really strong uh, personal statement, you'll stand a really good chance of getting in. And so she was my mentor for that. And I kind of hadn't thought much about it, but I wanted to learn more, especially in the plant science communication um, area, because knowing yourself about plant science is one thing, but being able to communicate that well with different target audiences in a way so that they trust what you're saying and that they're also engaged in what you're saying is a whole different matter. Um, so that's really what this three day course taught me. It was really fun, really well supportive. It really got you to tap into your creative side, which I think as scientists we often don't do. Um, and yeah, I'm really proud of the video that me and the person I was working with called Athena, we uh, shot this video. Um, we kind of had about two hours on the last day to do it. Uh, so yeah, I'm really proud of what we managed to come up with in such little time. Um, and it's about seagrass. And I think it's a really important topic because seagrass cover only 0.2% of the ocean floor, yet they're responsible for stochastic about 15% of marine organisms, of the carbon that marine organisms can capture. So they're really, really impressive, um, but they're at risk. About 20% of seagrass species have been lost um, since the 19th century. So I th we thought it was a topic that needed a lot more awareness um also to kind of get protection for them in place so i hope you enjoy fantastic video there from uh susanna so the awesome thing last month i was really lucky enough to go to the first uk seagrass symposium uh which susanna's video is all about and i've got to say when but what was really nice about this symposium is when you talk about the ocean or the problems with the environment it's normally bad news and quite depressing. 
I went to this seagrass symposium and what was great about it, obviously Susanna there briefly talking about uh, why seagrass is important, but what was really great about this symposium is the amazing work that's being done around the coast of the UK at replanting our seagrass beds and they're just sharing success stories and there wasn't a single talk at the whole symposium over three days that was negative. Everyone was like, we've been doing this and we've got these communities engaged and we planted the seagrass and the seagrass has come back and it's doing an awesome job. So, oh, it's um, really exciting, yeah. I, Always good to have those exciting, positive stories. Um, so I think we'll now hear more about seagrass. You're excited about seagrass already. Um, you've heard why it's so great. So uh, let's have some more seagrass. Seagrass! This is Simon the Seagrass. He's sad because no one appreciates the value that his underwater meadow ecosystems have in the fight against climate change. Often forests are at the forefront of conservation efforts because of their fantastic ability to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But Simon and his friends are even more efficient at burying carbon than some forests. For example, they are 35 times faster at carbon burial than tropical rainforests. Simon's hard work doesn't stop there though. His meadow provides a habitat for loads of different marine species, including commercial fishing stocks, and he helps to clean the water in the ocean by removing nasty pollutants. In fact, the services performed by Simon's Caribbean relatives contributes $255 billion to local and global economies every year. But we don't treat the seagrass as well. Simon's at risk of harm from shipping, a fishing technique called dredging, which scrapes seagrass off the ocean floor, and construction along the coast, as well as climate change. All these things together have meant that 30% of Simon's friends have been lost in the past 200 years, but there is hope. A new project has been set up by the WWF in partnership with other organisations such as Swansea University that aims to bring a new generation of seagrass to life off the coast of Wales with the help of lots of lovely volunteers. By 2050, the hope is that 2,500 new hectares of seagrass will be thriving, just like Simon is, due to the project's efforts, benefiting marine life and society as a whole. So clearly, you can see there, seagrass is ridiculously important. So, um, yeah, in terms of trying to fight climate change and that carbon absorption, as well as what we call ecosystem services, so just providing habitats for fish and, and things that we like to eat out the sea, is pretty important to go seagrass. Absolutely. Um, and you'll have seen uh, Susanna there at the end, uh, with, also with Athena Lamb as well, who also uh, contributed to that video. Um, we got distracted uh, with Susanna's introduction video there. So thank you very much to Susanna, Susanna and Athena for uh, giving us that wonderful video. Uh, we are now about to be joined by our first live guest. Uh, we have got Laura Crook, who's joining us from Rothamsted Research. She's going to be joining us online. Uh, good morning, Laura. Morning. How's it going? Uh, yeah. So we've got a little note here that says, as well, like a weed ecologist, that sounds awesome. I, I understand that there's no, I was told there's no such thing as a weed. A weed is just a plant <laughs> in the wrong place. Well, yeah. That's true. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, sorry, yeah, I say I'm a weed ecologist, but I actually um, I focus on one specific weed that's a real problem for uh, arable farmers in the UK, um, and that is something called blackgrass. Um, when it's and it well, it it looks it, it gets its name because it's a it's got a dark coloured seed heads. Um, and then when you see it ac across the fields, it's, it, that's what gives it its name as, as black grass. So, yeah. But um, I study some, I've, I've studied other weeds in the past as well, broadleaf weeds and, and grass weeds. But that's, yeah, I'm specifically looking at black grass at the moment. So what is the big problem with black grass? Could you talk us through, like, why it, this is an issue in agriculture and, uh, yeah, what you're trying to do about it? Sure. So, um, yeah, so, so black grass, it's, um, uh, it's very competitive, particularly for uh, farmers of winter wheat fields. Um, so it's, 
it's com it's competing for for the the light and the nutrients um which is a problem in itself but then its other main problem is that it has got has developed herbicide resistance so um a lot of the work that i do is um testing samples around the country um to see the levels of resistance and feeding that information back back to the farmers so then once you know about the, the different areas of resistance, maybe do people change what herbicides that they use on their on the weeds? Yes. So, um, yes, a lot of work we've done is is working out um, you know, the levels of resistance that, that farmers have got. And we, we did that. Um, we, we've done that very significantly and, and given given farmers a lot of a lot of help with knowing the levels of resistance um unfortunately there's quite a lot um but now we're we are now looking more into trying working out why they've got resistance and so there's uh, so working out um looking at the genetics um and you know working out the, the mechanisms that are causing that resistance um but yes and then there has been work done in the past to um it, it's a case of being um careful about the the herbicides that uh, farmers are using um but it, it's also then about using other techniques so um making sure you're rotating what different crops um uh yeah um different crops in the ground that they're growing so not always growing the winter wheat um or maybe growing spring crops instead um it's it's you know about those cultural techniques as well fantastic so i'm just curious as to how like in terms of your career pathway how you ended up to be studying uh weed ecology and uh, and obviously a massive impact it's what i guess it's one of those things that we don't necessarily think like has an impact on our food and where it comes from but yeah massive impact so would you mind like yeah talking us through how you got to be doing your amazingly important work uh, thank you so um i did i did a degree in environmental conservation um, which I think has been discussed before. It, it, you've discussed previously, like it's, it was, it was very wide. It was very kind of broad. Um, lots of different subjects, including plant science. Um, and um, I, yeah, when when I left university, I did some uh, uh, short term projects of doing some uh, surveying, um, and then I had. I eventually applied for a position as a technician, um, just thought it looked interesting. It had an, a more kind of practical outside element to it. So I applied for that um, and then, yeah, worked. And that was at Sheffield University, worked there for a couple of years and then joined Rothamsted um, close to 10 years ago now um, on this specific black grass project. So I suppose it, it kind of the it kind of found me actually <laughs> the uh, uh, the plant the plant science um and yeah so and then been been working on on this yeah specific um weed ever since um but i'm i'm very much a a, a practical um technician um i'm uh, not not often in a lab mostly found in the glass houses um we do a lot of field work as well which i really enjoy so yeah i'm 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 more on that that's like practical practical side and yeah so growing the plants in the glass houses um, we spray them with herbicides and see the results um, we do a lot of field work over the summer to look at the, the the amount of black grass that's out there on our on our farm network and yeah I'm um, more of that and, and I think the reason I've I really like being a technician is because it's very varied um sometimes you have to do the same thing for a couple of days but usually you can yeah there's there's lots of different jobs to do and that's um, yeah, that's really what I like about it. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Laura. It's really, uh, really interesting to hear about um, your route to working with plants and uh, how, how, you, how plants found you. Um, so I think that's really, really interesting to hear. Definitely. Well, I, mean, I'm, and I think you kind of hinted upon it a little bit there, but I was going to ask, well, what is the best thing about like the, the work you do, the job that you do? If you could uh, basically, I'm, we're trying to get as many people watching this to be like, yeah, I want to do what they do. That's the idea. <laughs> so, yeah, if you could yeah. talk us through that, that'd be yeah, awesome. Yeah, sure. I think um, 
it's probably the it's probably the the, the outside um, fieldwork element actually. Um, every summer for the past ten years, we've been going out to the same few fields to to see how much black grass there is out there, and that's just really interesting. And it's great to be out be outside. And uh, and then just recently this autumn, we've been doing. Um, uh, yeah doing some soil sampling actually so that's been really nice because I've not done that for, for a long time and so it's nice to get some different skills and do something do something a bit different and yeah I think it's the I think it's just the, the practical element of it all and and yeah doing doing different different things each day. Fantastic so I've just seen we've got a question coming over the uh, over the SAPS channel uh, it says has there been any unexpected twists or turns in your work? Things that have popped up where you've been like, what? Uh, I didn't think that was going to happen. Or you've had to take your research in a different direction. Um, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can think of an example of um, generally our work has taken a, a direction, but there have been times when we we once set up a big experiment and um, it it didn't work. Uh, it, it didn't work out. Um, and so, so unfortunately, yeah, we had to we had to kind of scrap it and start again. But we'd learned lessons from what we'd done with that. Um, uh, in in the particular way we were trying to grow some some of the black grass plants, and and so then yeah, we we learned the lessons from that. We had to start again and grow the plants again. Um, which is slightly time consuming because plants take these certainly these plants they take a while to grow but um but yeah and then and then we'd we we went to so then we could we we learnt the lessons from that and we could we asked around then and got some ideas on different methods and um yeah and and tried again and that was more successful so i think certainly that's something that yeah it's some sometimes it it doesn't work but actually kind of all data is good data, even if it's kind of no data, because then, yeah, you've, yeah, you, you, you've learned for next time and yeah, and you can, you can make, make changes and, and yeah, it's frustrating and it's a bit of a, um, bit of a, yeah, an unexpected twist, but yeah, it's, it, it's part of, part of science really to, um, to keep, to, to try again. Yeah, no. absolutely. Um, and I think just probably one final question uh, for you, Laura. I think, as I recall, you're sticking around a little bit. Am I making that up? Someone yeah. has given me a thumbs up. Um, so, you're yeah. sticking around a little bit. Um, yeah. So, um, but one final question for the time being. Um, mm -hmm. If you could give a bit of advice to undergraduates who are interested in plant science, what little bit of advice would that be? Um, I think that would be um, so. I was uh, I was lucky enough when I was at university to do um, to do some work over the summers in between um, you know one year ending, next year beginning, um, and so that and that gave me that was really good actually. That gave me some certainly some technician skills, um, and so I, I think it's just I think I'd say it's about looking out for opportunities um and and yes they don't some i mean that for instance some of that was in plant science but not all of it and so i think it's just kind of looking around for those opportunities and and kind of grabbing them really because then any little bits of experience you've got um can help you to to yeah to find your passion in in certain areas and to and also to kind of get those get those skills so then once you're yeah once you're out looking for 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 a job or the next the next thing then you've you've got that you've got that already to to show amazing i mean i think that's that's a great bit of advice for for any career any career <laughs> path as well is to take take the opportunities that come to you such as opportunities to come to an event like rootstock or to watch a live stream what an opportunity <laughs> there we go um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Laura, and we'll come back to you um, a little bit later on. Um, we are now going to head on to our next video, which is all about mosses. Um, and after that, we'll be joined live in the studio. Um, I can see her getting excited already. Um, I'm excited. By uh, Dr. Renska Vromans, uh, who uh, is involved in making this video as well. Uh, this video is by uh, Emily Burridge, Al Holland and Renska Vromans. Emily is at Royal Holloway Uni in 
at Royal Holloway University studying biology and Al is at the University of Aberdeen studying plant and soil science. So let's find out about mosses! <laughs> Look at this, look what I found. What is What's it? What's that? It's moss. Moss? How boring. Why should I care? So what use are mosses to me? With over 12,000 species, think about the possibilities. We can use them for medicine. Growing soils that we farm our food in. And when they're really sensitive, so they can tell us when something's going wrong where they grow. These look super simple, so they must be much less evolved. I know, they look so simple, but while mosses and other bryophytes, that's a group of plants they're in, share a lot of DNA with flowering plants, they've been evolving in their own direction for about 450 million years, just as long as other plants, so they're full of fascinating adaptations. So why haven't I heard about these? Exactly, unfortunately not very many people know much about them yet, but maybe we can start to change that by letting more people know and all of the fascinating things we have yet to discover about them. Cool! That was really good fun. That was really good fun. Uh, I'm sure that was a lot of fun to make. So, who's this? Look, it's not just us. The studio is much bigger. We've got seats over here. Hi, Renska. Hi, Russell. Hi, Thank Alex. Thanks for joining us uh, from your workplace. This is kind of cool. So, could you talk us through a little bit, I guess, first of all, about your video? Um, what was that like to make? Was it good fun? Why did you choose mosses? Because they're cool, obviously. <laughs> No, it was such fun. We had uh, a short amount of time to make it and a lot to say about mosses. So we had to cram everything into about one minute, which was exciting. Uh, but Al and Emily were really lovely to work with. They had so much energy for this, so that was great. And why did you decide? I mean, obviously, we've heard all about how mosses are wonderful. Um, but uh, why did you decide to, to look at mosses of all the plant science topics you could have chosen? Well, I am interested in evolution and it turns out that basically the first split in the plant lineage was between mosses and other plants. So if we want to understand something about how plants evolved, mosses are actually a really important group to look at. So, I have on my sheet, this is what, every day is a school day, this is what I've just learned. I always thought there was moss, and it was moss, and moss is just there, and it's moss. It turns out, there's 12,000 species of moss, 12,000 different types of moss, that's a lot of moss. Um, that's, that's my favourite moss fact of the day. There we go. And, and Russell always has a favourite moss fact of every day. Always, of always has. Um, we've also uh, still got uh, Laura on the line. Um, so I think we're going to bring Laura in as well. Um, uh, oh, sure. there, there she is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Why was I surprised when that happened? Um, so uh, I think what might be interesting to talk about here, um, please do add your comments on, um, on the Mosses video as well, Laura. Um, but actually, um, Laura works... Uh, and she's already said she works outside a lot, she works in the field a lot. Um, Ranska, is that where you do your work? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I sit behind a computer all day because I make computer models of how plants evolve. Uh, so I think there are some interesting uh, contrasts to be drawn between um, Laura, Laura and Renska's work. Um, so, so, I mean, I was going to say, it sounds quite an abstract concept. When you say, like, you build a computer model of how a plant works, like, I, I, could you kind of explain, like, what that actually, like, in my head, you're making a little plant on the screen, like, in a computer-aided design or, like, CGI plant. I'm sure that's not what you do. Maybe it is. I it is somewhat similar, but what we do is we have we represent a population of little plants in the computer and each little plant has some digital dna let's say that encodes how cells communicate with each other which cells grow and so how they make a plant basically and then when a plant is successful at making uh, a plant from its dna then it makes more offspring than other plants in the population and so then it passes on its DNA, it uh, 
you get some mutations in the DNA, and we repeat this process for thousands upon thousands of generations. So that's the advantage of making a computer model, that it is much, much faster than evolution in real life. Oh, interesting. So I'm curious then, Laura, because you're, you're very much out in the field, do you collaborate with any kind of modelers or computer scientists to kind yeah. of help to steer your work or to interpret any of the data that you're getting? Yes. So, um, yes, so we've, o over the years, we've had a lot of uh, experience of physically going to look at the, the black grass um, out in the field and then also, to say, looking at these cultural measures and things like that. But then, yeah, as time's gone on, Obviously, we've started, we've started to look at the genome of black grass. Um, so there's an element there. But then also, we, at the moment I, I mentioned that we were doing the soil sampling, actually that soil sampling is going to be used, that information is going to be used to put into a model. Um, we're working with um, a woman who's already designed a model, um, but we're going to, to kind of take that model and see if we can um, add more data to it. So all of this soil data will get added. Um, also the, the elevation, the resistance levels, so we can put all of that information in and that might help us to either maybe predict where the black grass might be in the field or um, or yeah, to look at the levels of resistance. And, and yeah, so definitely now our, our work is that we've got a level of understanding, but we're trying to to get more and 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 yeah and we're and as you say collaborating with other 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 colleagues to try and get a bigger bigger picture of it all so that's a really important important element of of that now these days awesome thank you very much so we've just got a question coming so obviously you're a scientist and we're kind of told scientists you just have to do science you, uh, doing things like science communication or making videos. Oh, why do I have to do that? So I've just seen we've got a question come in about the rootstock experience, what it was like working with the students and making the video. So I wonder if you could like elaborate a bit on that, but also talk a little bit about, I guess, the importance of communicating within your role. So I think uh, communicating about what we do is really important. Uh, not just because uh, we get public money, but also because we have a lot of fun doing what we do. We find what we do really interesting and we want to share that uh, enthusiasm. And so working with the students is also really cool because, uh, so for instance, as a modeler, I know how to make models. I have a general knowledge about evolution and development, but El knew a lot of cool facts about mosses and he was really enthusiastic about this process. Emily was a wizard with the technology to put the video together. So I learned a lot as well, uh, and I find that really rewarding about working with students. I think, I think it's really good, and I think there's this idea that a scientist just works by themselves in a lab in front of a computer, something like that. And I think more and more the modern academic is, I think it's, it's it necessary to cause societal change, to get your work in front of policy makers, decision makers, and to, to have, you know, something like farmers uptake your work. So I guess it's interesting, a similar question for you, Laura, then, because I'm guessing you have to do a lot of collaboration with policymakers or uh, agriculturalists, farmers, things like that. So could you talk a little bit about collaborating with these people and, or communicating with these people outside of the traditional academic space? Yeah, um, and certainly that that's something that I'm really interested in. Myself and my colleague are very, yeah, we're very much about trying to get that information back out to the farmers. We have a, a network of about uh, 60 farms that we um, that we are speaking to regularly over the years now um, with, with the issue of black grass. Um, and we're, we're always trying to make sure that we are feeding back that information to them because we think that that's really important, that it's rather than us doing the work down at Rothamsted, um, you know, we, we think they need to be knowing about what was, what is going on, what what we've been finding out, and then that that can help help the farmers and the the, the growers and the agronomists um, who advise the farmers. So yeah, so we we will send them feedback on on what we've seen over the summers. Um, we'll sometimes do. Um, 
uh, news newsletters to give them updates on what's going on um, and we'll attend um, shows agricultural shows or conferences and things like that to try yeah to try and get that message out there because yeah we 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 do believe that it's really important that they they're included in what we're we're doing as well amazing um you can really see how you can have uh having an impact that research that you're doing is um uh and the technical work you're doing how that really has an, can have an impact um in the real world um I, as lovely as it is to have both Renska and laura here um i think we need to say goodbye to them because we need to go on to um our next video um we've got a lovely uh comment from celia here um who's saying that she's really enjoying it um and enjoying the excitement from the presenters. Yes. So uh, we're good. doing a good job so far. Thanks, Celia. So thanks. Thank you very much um, to both uh, Laura and uh, to Renska. They are going to be hanging around. So if you've got any questions specific to either of these awesome scientists, do pop the questions in there. So let's get on to the next video. It's called Mycorrhizal Mobile. That's a good word, mycorrhizal. Always, I have a nightmare trying to spell that word. But this is by Dominic Leach, uh, Nadin uh, ooh, Bayer Ramova, Lucinda Cullen, and Nia Feeks. So let's go. check out this video. Mycorrhizal. Are you a lonely tree having trouble communicating? Well, you need Mycorrhizal Mobile, the fungal network that helps you talk to other trees. Don't believe us? Let's hear from our happy customers. Mycorrhizal Mobile. Hey bro, are you fruiting? Yeah. Sick, I will too. Mycorrhizal mobile. I'm a young tree and hungry. Transfer some food. Okay. Mycorrhizal mobile. Hey bro, are you being eaten? Yeah. Cool, let me put up some defenses. Mycorrhizal mobile. Yo, are you on fire? Yeah. Okay, let me drop some seed. All for the low, low price of a cozy shelter and a few glucose a month. Terms and conditions apply. This company operates on a symbiotic relationship. We help you and you help us. If our glucose cost isn't paid, our services will no longer operate. Defenses come in salicylic acid and jasminates. Food transfers include proteins, sugars, starches and more. Improve your network. Choose Mycorrhizal Mobile. Well, hey. I know what I'm going to have stuck in my head for the rest of the day. Mycorrhizal Mobile! What a great, what a great jingle. There we go. Um, I think as well as promoting Mycorrhizal Networks, this team should definitely, definitely get into advertising. That was quite good. Yeah, um, I think it's a really great example of um, how using, using comedy can uh, have an impact in science communication as well. I'm going to change that to my ringtone every time I get a text. <laughs> there we go. Um, right, what we have got who we have got <laughs> hanging out behind the scenes is Dominic Leach, who was responsible for one, one of those humans. Hello, Dominic, who was in charge of, well, responsible for making that awesome video. Uh, so Dominic, could you talk us through a little bit about why you chose to do Macrazo Mobile? Um, well, our original inspiration came from Better Call Saul where he does the adverts in, in the TV show. And then um, I read a book which was called um, Hidden Life of Trees. And I thought it was really interesting, uh, sort of the way that plants communicate, because we often see them as quite sessile, individualized. And I was like, one of the things that really got me into plant science is seeing how they interact with all the surroundings. And we thought a good way of like, people watch Better Call Saul, it's a popular TV show. So we sort of link that to the interest in science. We were like, it'd be a really cool video. Took a long time though. <laughs> Fantastic. And so in, in terms of working with the others in your team and, and your role within that, were you kind of bringing in the, the, the kind of content? Yeah, what were your different roles in making the video? Um, I was on the camera um, <laughs> and uh, I sort of, cause I read about it. So I sort of brought the, the ideas and then we worked together and I did not make the trees. That was the other group members. <laughs> and then um, we sort of came up with the jingle together. Um, so it was, it was pretty collaborative. I, I don't think there was anyone that 
did something specifically. We all sort of worked together. Amazing. That's what it's about. Um, so, uh, Dominic, I'm just looking down here. So you um, are at the university. Uh, no, hang on. Yeah. You're at the University of Southampton. I was looking at the wrong bit for my cue card. Um, and you're studying <laughs> biology. Um, did you yeah. go into studying your biology degree expecting to be interested in plants? Or was that something that came a bit later? So when, when did your interest in plants start, I suppose? Oh, I did not like plants when I started my degree. <laughs> I, I went in wanting to do marine biology. Um, and then I, I think a lot of kid like peach students going in think plant science is quite boring so i got offered because my tutor was a plant scientist matthew terry he was like you should go to this gatsby thing and i was like okay i'll go to the gatsby thing and i went and I, my mind was blown of all the cool things you could do with plant science and learning about how they communicate um what really captivated me was the confocal imaging we can do with plants and seeing all these like amazing um phenotypes and all these random things and the fact that you can just take a plant you can just mess with its genetics which you can't really do in much other sciences <laughs> it's quite manipulative and you can just be like i'm just going to get rid of that gene and see what happens and these sort of things got me quite excited about it and, and the applications of plant science is obviously massive so i was like that's what got me into it um was really sort of the gatsby and then i went off from that amazing well, and so i was going to say so you having gone to the gatsby plant science summer school and having mm. that ignited mm. Then the following summer, not only were you able to attend Rootstock, but you were also doing an internship here in the Cambridge lab. So could you talk to us about what the internship involved and, uh, yeah, and what you were studying, researching, and what that was like to do the internship and how you got on the internship in the first place? Go, internship. Gosh, okay, solo questions. Um, <laughs> so I, I met the, my supervisor, which was Chris Whitewoods at Gatsby. And I watched his research and I was like, that's super cool. So <laughs> I shot him an email in the September afterwards and I was like, can I work with you, please? Your research is so incredible. I, I, he was working with Utricularia at the time. And then we got to talking and he eventually offered me the, the summer placement. And I, that, I ended up doing a Rabidapsis staliana and I was looking at how air spaces inside leaves uh, develop and expand. So we often see leaves as just one flat thing, but they're actually really complex in the middle. And they have all these little air spaces for gas exchange and water and transpiration and lots of other things. And understanding how they expand is actually not well understood. So a lot of my research was around imaging different um, Arabidopsis grown in different conditions to see what is what's changing you know when they're growing at higher temperatures are those air spaces bigger or smaller and lots of other questions I explored uh, gibberellic acid really for me it was the the confocal imaging that got me excited about it um, and then um, I, I tell you I, I think it's a really important if you're interested in plant science research to work in a lab and figure out what research is like Research is a huge investment of time and money to do, pursue as a career and having experience in the lab like I did and talking to other researchers and going to conferences like Plants at Cambridge, which I've got an opportunity to do, is so important in figuring out is plant science really for you? And for me, it was. I had a really fantastic time. I think that's fantastic. And I've got to say, I'm really and I think the message within that is if you're interested in something, just email people and see what happens because it quite often leads to amazing things. Step one, flattery. Step one, your research is amazing. <laughs> Hi, can I work for you? Brilliant, life, that's a life lesson there, definitely. Thank you ever so much, Dominic. It's been great to talk to you and thanks for the awesome video. Mycorrhizal mobile, there we go. It's in my head forever. So now we've got another video. You might have noticed that Alex I've got no idea what's going rather on. professionally were like, I don't need these, <laughs> and just threw them everywhere. So Alex, it says here that we've now got a video coming up called Trees versus Squirrels, The Master Plan. And this is by uh, Max Moorcroft, Annabelle Knutson, and Poppy Flack. Let's do it. And then we're going to hear from Max afterwards. Trees versus Squirrels. Every day, all over the world, squirrels are eating acorns, nuts, and fruit. And every day, all over the world, 
Trees are outraged that squirrels are eating their offspring. But the trees have a mighty plan. Masting. What is this, you ask? Using an underground fungal network, the trees coordinate to fruit all in the same summer. These are called mast years. This produces too much fruit for all the squirrels to eat, meaning that some seeds will be left behind to grow into trees. Squirrel numbers dramatically increase. But in following years, the trees hardly fruit. This was the tree's master plan all along. But trees have a new enemy. Climate change is causing mast years to become more frequent. Scientists are working to better understand how natural communities live so that we can help them thrive. I really, really enjoyed that video. I thought that was uh, absolutely brilliant, really, really good fun. Uh, and clearly some great TikToks there. My favourite bit was when they put, I love it when they put like that stupid face on the tree. <laughs> I just think it looks, <laughs> I just think it looks really good. I uh, was just like, that was brilliant. And I, I think in that video, it's really cool, really highlights symbiosis. Squirrels, acorns, Oak it's trees. Not, it's not technically symbiosis. Is it not? It's, yeah, it's more just like ecology, interactions. Why is it not symbiosis? Well, symbiosis is... They help each other. Oh, I'm not sure. The squirrels, anyway. eat, the squirrels eat their acorns. <laughs> we've anyway. got Max to talk to. Oh, yeah, Max, we've got Max. Max can Max, correct us. Max, Max can correct us. Right so, we've got Max coming in from the University of Bristol studying plant science. So, hi, Max, how's it going? Oh, yeah, yeah, good. Oh, yeah, 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 good. So you were here at Rootstock and you chose to make this awesome video. Uh, what, was the, what was the impetus behind kind of this? Uh, like what made you think, oh yeah, we need to do the squirrels versus trees thing? So I'd say that um, the fact that not many people actually know about it, even though we see oak trees around and people know that oak trees make acorns and um, a load of other deciduous trees have their own fruit. But they, not many people really know that actually these fruit don't come out every single year. Um, and it has an effect on the further ecosystem. And just that, yeah, just, it's just a really cool thing that we thought this fact needs to be out in the, in the public domain a bit more. Yeah. Fantastic. So. I, I think it's really nice to, to link to something that people see all the time. Right, so people, people generally, people know what an acorn looks like. Um, if you don't, Google an acorn, um, and then you'll know. Then you'll see know what to know what to look for, how to spot an oak tree. Um, and every time you see an oak tree, you'll be reminded of um, Max, uh, Annabelle, and Poppy's video. Um, so thank yeah, thanks very much. Max. So I was, uh, as you might have heard earlier, we were having an argument about whether it's it was nice. <laughs> about whether it was symbiosis. As I, I mean, so first of all, is it symbiosis? I would also, I would argue that it's not, um, just because, I, I, just just because it kind of has, I guess the the increase in acorn levels causes the squirrels to have an influx in population levels, um, but they don't exactly work together. It's almost like a an interspecies competition that they're trying to they live without one, each other one, yeah that's what you know they can live without each other I, just as i was reflecting symbiosis is where you've got two organisms that rely on each other for for their existence well who yeah that you can't one can't survive without the other fine nerds that's <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just saying that because i lost there we go that's fair enough Good point. I like this specific definition of symbiosis. I think it's right. So, Max, what is quite rare is that you're probably the first person that we've chatted to that is just doing plant science at <laughs> university. Could you talk us through about how you got into plants and what the decision was to study plant science at degree level? Yeah, of course. So my love for plant science actually didn't come from biology. So I didn't do a biological um, A-level, which kind of maybe set me back for the first year. Um, I, I really had to kind of work very hard for first year. But where did it come from? I'd say that it came from just a, a, an innate love for plants. 
Um, so I would go and sit by this tree um, and then somebody said like they gave me this tree tree book which they found in the charity shop and said maybe you'll be interested in that. Learn as many of the trees as possible um, and then just realised that I loved to learn about all of these facts um, about the trees and then that's turned into wildflowers and I hope that it turns a bit more into mosses because currently my moss knowledge is very very dire um, but I would say yeah so just a love for plants and I applied for plant science on a whim just because I thought oh yeah plants that would be cool because I love plants as kind of a um, um, just in case and the rest was going to be at natural sciences um, for chemistry and maths. And then just kind of at the last minute, I said, I don't really want to do chemistry or maths. I just want to learn about plants. Um, so it was very much just a, sto a, st a story of love for plants. Story between Max and the plants of the world. Um, on to mosses next. Um, I was going to say, so, you came to Rootstock and you learnt these kind of communication skills. You, you, your plant love continued to grow. So what's next? Where are you, where are you taking uh, your plant science degree as you go further into it? Um, so I realised um, that going into plant science, it wasn't exactly always what I had expected. So I was expecting like a lot more botanically based. Um, stuff like learning random facts, whereas it's been a lot more biological. Um, but I would say that I, I'm going to probably continue in using plant science as a way for learning more about ecology and conservation. Um, so I think I can see myself going into ecology and conservation, but with a very, very botanically focused thing. So I would love to maybe work for the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. Um, or um, or maybe do some science communication, like with like what Rootstock has kind of helped with. Um, I'm very interested in science communication, especially ju just getting people into plants and showing people that plants are very very cool um, and they shouldn't be overlooked as much as they are. Definitely. Fabulous. Well, you're clearly already doing a great job at science communication, Max. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really great to, to have you um, and to chat with you um, and to hear how you're getting on. Um, but we must move on to our next video. Um, you will also notice that we've got someone else um, in the, in the uh, symbiosis conversation. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you to Celia for um, backing up my argument with Russell. There. Good, that's fine. <laughs> I clearly don't really know what symbiosis means. So um, I'll, I'll find now. So I right, he's technically a there physicist. That's fine, technically. Right, next video. Let's move it along. We have got our next video. It is called Traditional Plant Medicines, which I'm quite intrigued to hear about. So let's roll the video. Morning, Matty. Are you ready for Rooster? Morning, you two. I was born ready, but I've got a really bad cough. <coughs> Did you know the fruit after the tree can't help you? No way. I never knew that. What tree is this? And how do you know? This is Jingo tree. The recipe has been used in traditional Chinese medicine for a thousand years. You just cook the fruit, uh, eat it, you will feel better. Thanks so much, you two. I never knew that. There's so much we can learn from plants. How are you feeling this morning? The anxious. I didn't sleep well last night. Do you know about the lavender plant? There's loads of it in the Cambridge Botanical Garden. No, please tell me. I actually have some here. The oils from this flower have been used in aromatherapy since the ancient Egyptian times. I had some of these last night and I slept like a baby. I even dreamt I was a bee feeding on all the lovely lavender. Modern medicine is effective but can be limited. There are many plant and fungal remedies known to traditional cultures and now backed up by scientific research. Through collaborations between both cultures and traditional knowledge in modern science, there's so much to be gained and learned. Fantastic, really great video. And I think it really highlights how much traditional knowledge and compounds and things that are inside plants we've been using for thousands of years that we're only now being like, oh, okay, what is that chemical in there? And trying to extract those to form uh, modern medicines.
Yeah, I think um, that video uh, was from Matty Jobson and um, Yuki Cheng, um, who uh, presented that video. I think that really did show that. Um, and actually, if you want to learn a bit more about the research that's going on in this area and the work that people are doing, um, we've got uh, a video on the Gatsby Plant Science Summer School YouTube channel. Um, we've got an interview uh, there which is all about uh, research looking at traditional uh, uses of plants and how um, people are researching that and how we can sort of make connections between these, these two different areas. Definitely. So uh, she's called Dr. Rebecca Lazarou based in London, and she is an ethnobotanist. She's been working at Kew Gardens to go back through historical documents and see these traditional folk remedies and tie them in with like modern, uh, I guess, kind of botany uh, to find out and to look at the compounds within these and to use, I guess, kind of natural compounds that are found within plants to, to do healing. And, you know, most of the time, I can't, I, is it 60% of the compounds that are in medicines are derived from naturally from plants? It's I, a, wouldn't, I wouldn't remember that sort of number, but it's certainly a lot. There's lots of um, medicines uh, to be found in plants. So if that's something you're interested uh, in doing, is finding uh, new, uh, new medicines, then do think about looking for them in plants. And I think a lot of what Rebecca does is facilitating communication between different groups of people with different types of knowledge. Um, so more traditional knowledge, um, and I think hers is quite UK based, but people do this and they work um, also talking to um, people in, for example, indigenous communities around the world um, to find out how, how they have their, they have scientific knowledge about, about plants and about the way that we can use plants and how we can integrate that um, with, with other understandings of plants. Definitely, and there's, I mean, I guess at the other end of the spectrum, there's also some amazing research happening at the John Innes Centre uh, around this flower called the Madagascan periwinkle, which has got uh, cancer healing properties within it. But the problem is, is those, the ca compound that cures cancer within the flower is at such low concentrations, we have to harvest a lot of these flowers to do it. So they are doing research at the John Innes Centre to increase the concentration of this compound within a Madagascan periwinkle flower, which is going to make harvesting easier, which will hopefully bring down the cost of cancer medication. Well, it's funny that you mentioned flowers, Russell, because actually that is the theme of our next uh, three videos. Um, now, the first one we've got coming up uh, is going to be from Fuse School. Um, you, hopefully you also that comment uh, from Dom as well saying he was having and really enjoyed joining us. Thank you again, Dom. Thanks, Thanks Dom. for joining us. Thanks, Dom. Um, we've got the first one from Fuse School, then we've got two more rootstock videos, and I think if I'm right, those are our final rootstock videos um, for this morning session. Um, but the first one we're going to hear from is from Fuse School. We mentioned Fuse School at the start. Yeah. Um, Fuse School are all about democratising access to science education. They've got loads of videos online. They're available globally on YouTube. Um, you can find out about all sorts of different types of plant science there. Um, if anyone's looking for somewhere to find some revision, it's also very handy for that. It's great um, for revision. And we're also going to be, we're going to be joined by Tatum from... Uh, Fuse School um, a little bit uh, later on, um, if so, I'm right. Yes, yes I'm we right. are. So we are going to see, we've got basically loads of videos now about flowers. I love flowers. Flowers are awesome. And it kind of annoys me that everyone's just like, oh, they're just a pretty thing. They are so cool. And we're going to find out why they're important and why they're really good fun. So uh, let's play the first of our flower videos. Around a third of our global crops depend on animal pollination for their production. Almost all of these crops rely on flowers to attract animals to themselves, and so, if flowers vanished, we could lose 35% of all our crops. That's roughly equivalent to having one less meal per day for every person on Earth. So you can see just how vital flowers are to our food supply. This video will look at the role of the flower and why they are so important to us. 
You probably already know that flowers attract the pollinators that they need by being bright and colourful. They are therefore contrasting to the leaves and stems that support them and stand out in a field of green. They frequently also produce sweet nectar which many animals feed upon. The animals visit to collect this nectar, in doing so get covered in pollen and carry this to other plants. There is a downside however, often the nectar and these big bright flowers cost an awful lot of energy to produce. Plants have evolved other ways to attract their pollinators. This is why some flowers also have other clever ways of attracting animals. For example, some plants have coloured veins or spots on their petals to guide visitors to the nectar, just like those people on a runway with ping pong bats. Others have regions which soak up heat from the sun and slowly radiate this back out again, just like a radiator for pollinators. There are even some flowers which are so specifically evolved that only one insect can visit them. Sorry, no nectar for you unless you have a 30 cm long tongue. All these pollinator attraction tactics help move the male pollen from one plant to another. But why do plants bother? When plants produce... Whoa, there we go. Awesome video there from Fuse School. And no nectar for you unless you've got a 30 centimetre long tongue, Russell. Fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about that video is I think at school, we just, it's all about bees. And mm. it's just bees, bees, bees. And the bees go here and the bees do it. And what I really liked in that video is it really showed the range of pollinators. It showed the birds. Not many people realise those are pollinators. Right at the end there, it showed us the moth. Uh, and I believe what it was alluding to there was the Darwin's orchid, uh, where this orchid was growing and they were like, oh, we don't know what pollinates that. And so Darwin predicted the existence of a moth with a ridiculously long tongue that would have pollinated that before we'd actually found the moth. And here in the botanic garden, there is actually a specimen of that. And I love the story behind that, that kind of interdependence of mm. the plant and animal working together. Did I use that phrase right, interdependence? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. I'll take that. Yes. Um, so, um, so that moth has now been discovered, just to make yes. sure that's yeah. really clear. Right, more about flowers. We've got plenty to say about flowers. We've got another um, rootstock video. This one was made by two researchers here from the Sainsbury Laboratory um, in the Sainsbury Laboratory, Cambridge. I should just be clear about that. Um, so this is from Lucy and Elena. Once upon a time, fields were rich in flowers and bees. Bees were happy and easily getting the food for their family and baby bees by visiting flowers. But progressively, human actions severely impacted the varieties of flowers and number of pollinators. And this is very scary because while bees feed on the flowers, they also pollinate them. And most of the vegetables and fruits we consume in our daily diets come from the crops that rely on pollinators. That's why scientists decided to tackle the problem and study how flowers develop the beautiful colorful patterns on their petals and how these patterns catch pollinator attention. Like people, flowers come in all, the sh all, all shapes and sizes and different pollinators like different petal patterns. We are using variants of hibiscus trianon flowers to study how changes in petal pattern impact bee attraction. We found that even subtle changes like reduction in pigmentation can have a major impact on bees attraction. And hopefully one day we can use this knowledge generated in our lab to help the bees finding their flowers. Phenomenal. I really love those animations. And I think I remember uh, Elena and Lucy making that video and they panicked because I think uh, they had to hand it in and then they accidentally like deleted it or something like that, like oh. half an hour before they had to hand it in. So that, that video, they were, ah, and they quickly like made it again. And so I was, I was well impressed. Mm -hmm. Um, really love the hibiscus flowers in there and they are amazing hibiscus flowers and there's a lot of work that happens here in the Cambridge lab looking at the weird properties of hibiscus mm -hmm. flowers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thinking about making those flowers more attractive to 
pollinators, particularly bees. So bees are important. Bees we, might, are. we might have dismissed them a bit before, but bees are very important too. Um, we've got another video about flowers. Um, so this one is from William Withers. Um, and this is all about wildflowers. And it's called Wildflowers. Wildflowers! Wildflowers. <laughs> Play it. Since the 1930s, the UK has lost over 97% of its meadows. This has had a devastating effect on our biodiversity, but there is certainly still hope. Wild plants are found in green spaces in urban and rural environments alike, but often they don't get the chance to grow and flower, as some people deem wild areas as untidy. The same mentality is applied to our gardens, with traditional sprawling cottage gardens replaced with slabs and fake plastic lawn. Allowing wildflowers to grow doesn't help just the plants, but also provides habitat and food for insects, birds and mammals. Communities could come together to establish meadows in their local areas, giving people the chance to get outside and make new connections. And successful initiatives like No Mo May can allow people to appreciate the importance and beauty of wild plants. If we are to have a more sustainable future, we must change our mentality towards wildflowers in our spaces. I believe the future of biodiversity depends on the integration of wildlife into gardens and public spaces, creating an interconnected network of habitat where nature can flourish. Awesome video there, and I think it has a really important message there, where it's this idea that for some reason we think that good is this pristine manicured lawn of short grass, and unfortunately it's that mindset that is really reducing the amount of plant biodiversity across the UK, particularly people that put in artificial lawns that just blitz and let, just get rid of everything, and instead just cover the ground in this substance that just puts loads and loads of microplastics into the soil. So please just promote more natural environments, wildflower spaces in your garden, and don't use artificial grass. Awful stuff. Yeah, and speaking of uh, lovely natural spaces, um, extra special thanks to the University of Cambridge Botanic Garden, who are just, just over there, um, uh, for uh, those, the, many of those, in fact, probably all of those flowers that were in, in that video um, that, that, William, uh, that William made. Uh, so thank you for those, for those mm. plants as well. Oh, I've got to say the Botanic Garden is an amazing space. So we're drawing towards the end of our live stream, but not before we hear a little bit more about Few School, and we're going to have a talk, we're going to have a chat with uh, Tatum from Few School. So we've got a little video that's going to introduce what Few School is all about. We've already kind of hinted at that. Um, so this explains what Few School is, what they do, and then we're going to have a chat with Tatum. So let's take it away. Since the 1930s, the UK has lost over 97% of its meadows. This has had a dev Education shouldn't be a boring one hour slot. At Few School, we believe that education should be immersive, high quality, and accessible to everyone. And so, we took secondary school science and math curriculums and broke them down into small bite-sized chunks of learning. We are trusted by thousands of teachers and used by ministries of education across the world. Support us by subscribing and help us keep education free through Few School Con Brilliant stuff. Few School doing a really important job, trying to keep education free, for everyone. So let's bring Tatum into the studio uh, where we can have a chat and hear about what it's like to run this ridiculously successful YouTube channel. Hi Tatum, how's it going? Hi everybody, hello, I'm good, how are you? Can you hear me? See you again. So, talk <laughs> us through what is it like managing this I mean, I, or have you got something like three quarters of a million subscribers across View School? Clearly, what you're doing is really important and people are really uh, recognize that. So, yeah, can you talk through what it's like to run this channel? Well, it's really amazing because we get to work with fundamentally education and to provide resources and material for kids all over the world. As we know, uh, we have different styles of learning. Some kids learn by just going through a book and then you have your visual and auditory learners. So we really are passionate about breaching the gap 
and making sure our resources are there to stimulate and engage students, no matter what their learning style is. Phenomenal. I really, really enjoyed the flower video as well. So we've noticed you've got some plant science content on there. Could you talk us through the making of the, of the, the flower video that you showed us? Right. So first of all, we have our scripts that we work with um, and collaborate with different teachers. And then we go into our group meetings where we basically uh, storyboard everything about how we want to visually bring this across. And we break it down into the, the most basic concepts. And I think this is the, 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 the hardest part is like, what point are you going to highlight the best part of the information to make it relatable and easily to retain for our students? So that is basically what we do. And then the animation process, the colors, the style guide, the fonts, all of that follow through. And as you can see, keeping it simple is the most important part, making sure that what is seen on screen is the most important facts of what we want our students or basically any child to take away from the video, making sure that it's concise, um, it's visually impactful, and then, yeah, just making sure it's easy to understand and that the language is easy. Yeah, I would agree that that's one of the real challenges in science communication work, especially if you yeah. know lots about a subject and some people watching might pick this up from me and Russell today, that we know lots about plants and we want to share it all. Yeah. We've got to stick to the important messages. Um, we've had a question um, come in via the Science and Plants for Schools channel. Um, saying thank you, Fuse School, for, uh, for joining us today. Um, What's one of the biggest challenges that you face with your mission? I think the, one of the biggest challenges is just making sure that our content is available everywhere. Um, YouTube is an amazing platform and we are able to push out as many videos as we possibly can, but time constraints uh, can fall in as well and making sure that each child everywhere in the world has access to internet. Um, <laughs> if, that, if that makes sense, not every area is developed enough to have um, stable internet. So I think one of the, the challenges we face is making sure our content really reaches every person out there. Um, and then, yeah, just keeping it short. Sometimes we, we have so many great concepts that, that we want to push across, but then you have to really like fine tooth comb through it all to make sure um, that you, you really get the best content out there. Yeah, it can be really heartbreaking to lose lose some of those things sometimes. Absolutely. Definitely. So we, I was going to say, we've got another question come in. Do you have any tips or tricks for explaining scientific topics in, in, a, in an easy way within a video? I think it comes down to language. Uh, it's like a three-part sk skeleton. If you take up what is the most important content that you want to learn, you can build your vocabulary around that. Try not to add too much to it. Keep it very simple. And the shorter, the better. Short, powerful, impactful. Fantastic. And so I'm curious as to how you got into science communication. I mean, I mean fundamentally, you're like, OK, I run this educational YouTube channel, but fundamentally you are an incredibly successful and impactful science communicator. So how did you arrive uh, at, in this position? Well, I taught for 10 years in South Africa. I was a teacher and as a teacher, we talk a lot. Um, but I think what what drove me and what drove my passion into uh, pushing through school is the fact that I, I want people to learn. I want people to be excited to learn. I want them to understand, listen, there's more than one way to learn. You can learn through various platforms, various um, ways. And I think communication is part of that. And I think being a teacher and learning from my students and how they learn, that has ultimately propelled me to where I am today and making sure that the content that we push forward um, is for the students first, learner-centered. Phenomenal. Really good to know. I'll and just add a, add a shout out to all the teachers out there. Um, anyone who's watching are doing a fantastic job um, exciting their students uh, about yeah. science and hopefully about plant science as well. Definitely, definitely. So I was going to ask, what's next for Fuse School? What have you got coming up? What's on the horizon? 
Oh, we're working on some good stuff. So everybody know the world of AI is out there and we experiencing changing our top videos into some amazing languages to reach more kids out there and localizing uh, the languages for them. So we're busy doing the forerunning in, in AI and um, languages as well as year seven and eight mathematics. We're busy with creating videos to help and resources for the classroom, for the teachers. Um, and then we've got something special uh, in the pipeline, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say anything, uh, but we, we all know that sometimes students like to use ChatGPT and uh, to help them suss out and do the homework. So we, we're busy trying to do some amazing things with View School, creating a platform for students where they can interact with us. And when they stuck, they have someone on this side that can help them on the other side. So yeah, sometimes talking through something can help you uh, solve the problem. So we, we're busy with a lot at the moment. Oh, they sound really, ex really exciting projects, Tatum. Um, yeah. I think that's really interesting, like thinking about using AI in that, in that way. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Have you, Got. We've talked a bit about careers um, in, in research, and a, a, both as a scientist, um, a research scientist, and as a technician. Um, Max then mentioned uh, that he maybe wants to go on to work in science communication. Have you got any tips for any budding science communicators out there, any career tips? Absolutely. What I've picked up from uh, Max is that he's very passionate. And I think being passion driven about science and how the world works will actually propel you into to kind of taking your career to the next level. And especially in science communication, taking an idea and turning it into something that is engaging and concise and clear for the person to understand. It doesn't matter what the subject is, the topic is, just make sure the way you are communicating it to someone else is is strong and, and that the message is, is clear. So one thing that I would say is make sure that you harness your skills, develop your skills, practice your skills, writing, speaking, go into a different platforms like social media platforms where you can play a, play a bit with your TikTok and see how the apps work and how you can reach out. And we live in a digital age. I mean, come on, you know, everybody's on their devices all the time. So stay relevant, keep up to date and make sure you are adaptable to the technologies that that is out there as well as the trends um and then with science communication there's so many avenues that you can go into so i think education is is formal education is a really great way journalism making sure you take your research into presentation um is a good way uh for for people out there to get into science comms so absolutely make sure that your voice is heard make sure you make noise Oh, thanks, Russell. Um, <laughs> I think that's a great that's a great summary, and it really relates to what we're trying to do with Rootstock. It's about having a go. It's about we've made these video. The students and researchers made these videos over three days in the summer, and we just said, just give it a go. Um, and we're really grateful also to Siren Calling, who supported us with running this event and really getting those students um, going on those videos. I think we have to say goodbye to Totem to now as well. Goodbye. Thank you so no. much for joining us. Lovely, lovely to see you again and keep up the awesome work. And we're also going to say goodbye to the people watching temporarily because in three minutes. In three minutes. Okay, there we go. Well, we've got three minutes left. So we are coming back with another live stream uh, at two o'clock, I believe. Uh, where we're going to be following up with some more videos and some more interviews. So uh, keep those questions coming in. Definitely check things out. There's going to be going to have links in the video afterwards for all of the institutions and the people that we've talked about. So you can follow it up. You can see things. And we'll even afterwards, if you're watching back the live stream, have those little pop-up cards in YouTube. So you can be like, oh, click on that. Oh, click on that. And that's the noise you'll make, obviously, when you click yeah, on those absolutely. things. So that's what I do when I'm, uh, when I'm looking at YouTube videos. Don't we all. Yes. Um, some, one of those links will be uh, to Science and Plants for Schools, which is the project um, that I normally spend um, all of my time working on. Russell's just dashing to collect yeah. one of our snazzy posters oh. um, that we've uh, had 
that we've released. Maurice, you're trying to open it the wrong way. I am trying to open um, it. Look, Snaz poster. Look at that. You were one of those for your classroom walls. You need to check out the SAPS website. Yeah, absolutely. Get in touch. Um, posters should have been sent out to uh, all state schools across the UK. Um, but if you, um, if you haven't received any, get in touch and we can send them out. This is the fourth poster. Um, which won't have come in your pack. So if you want one of these, it's all about ways. It's called Want to Change the World. It's all about ways you can change the world um, by working in plant science. And there's accompanying resources on the SAPS website. Everything is, as with few schools, few school rather, everything is completely freely available. Um, so uh, thank you to our funders, the Gatsby Charitable Foundation, uh, for enabling us to make that completely free. I would just like to say about this theme, want to change the world. I think one of the things about plant science, I'm going to, when you talk to people and they're like, what do you want to do when you grow up? You're like, I want to be a doctor because I want to save lives. I've just got to say, if you become a plant scientist, you can save millions of lives. Becoming a plant scientist, you are going to deal with the hardest, the biggest issues, climate change, feeding the world, sorting out the environment, biodiversity loss. Literally, plant science is going to save the world and have such a massive impact. You, ca you cannot have a bigger impact on this planet. I say, literally, want to change the world? Get into plant science. Absolutely. And if you want to know more about plant science and the things you can do with plants, uh, then join us for our second live stream, uh, which is starting at 2 p.m. right back where you're watching right now. Um, but for now, we'll say goodbye and we'll, we'll join you again later. Goodbye. Thanks for watching. Thank See you, you soon. Bye. Cue the disco music. Disco outro. Disco outro.